Okay, uh, welcome everybody to the lecture this afternoon, the first lecture in the fall 2022 history lecture series sponsored by the CSI uh, CUNY History Department. A very warm welcome to all of you. Um, we are still waiting for people to enter the Zoom room. It's just four minutes past two. We'll just take a minute or two more to let people enter the room and then we will start our proceedings for this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, various uh, informations uh, regarding today's uh, lecture you can find in the chat. Okay, it's five minutes past two. I think we will now officially open the proceedings. As I said before, a very warm welcome to all of you attending the first lecture uh, in the fall 2022 history lecture series sponsored by the CSI CUNY History Department. Uh, my name is Professor Eric Iverson, and I am the co-host and co-moderator of this lecture with my colleague, Adjunct Assistant Professor Joseph Frushi. Our lecture today is Between Past and Present, Ukrainian Art in the Face of War, which is being given by Katerina Yakovlenko, Senior Fellow at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the U at University College London in the UK. Before introducing our speaker, we have a few announcements uh, about the format of today's lecture, and I've also put some information in the chat. First of all, uh, if you have not done so already, could you please mute your microphones since they may intervene, interfere with the sound quality of this Zoom lecture. Um, second, uh, we are curating questions uh, today. So that means that uh, we will have a question and answer session after uh, Katya's talk. Uh, and we invite you to type your questions into the chat. Uh, then Joe and I will read out these questions in the order in which they come in, and we'll see how many we get through. Uh, today, uh, our proceedings will close at 3.30 this afternoon. So after the lecture, we will have, I hope, a good 40 minutes or so uh, for questions. Uh, Joe, would you like to say something about uh, Clue Credit? Yes, thank you, Dr. Iveson. So for those students that are attending today seeking clue credit, I need you to send your name and EMPL ID to me uh, at joseph.frushi at csi.cuny.edu so that I can get you the credit that you are seeking for attendance. Thank you so much and back to you, Eric. Thank you, Joe. Okay, so it's my very, gr very great pleasure to welcome our distinguished speaker today, uh, Katerina Yakovlenko, who is speaking to us from London in the UK. So uh, please remember that uh, uh, it's it's 7 p.m. Uh, where uh, Katia is now. So we're very grateful that she's 
uh, taking her time this evening to speak to us five hours earlier here in New York City. Uh, Katya Yakovlenko is a Luhansk born Ukrainian visual art researcher and writer. Uh, Katya is completing her postgraduate thesis in new media and communication at the Ivan Franco University of Lviv. She worked as a reporter and deputy web editor of the Ukrainian newspaper, The Day, also as a curator and program manager of the Donbash Studies Research Project at Isolia Tasia, I hope I've said that correctly, and as a researcher and as curator of public programs at the Pinchuk Art Center in Kiev. Uh, Katia is the author of a number of publications and she is currently senior fellow at the uh, Distinguished School of Slavonic and East European Studies at University College London in the UK. So please join us in welcome, welcoming uh, Katerina Yakovlenko and her lecture titled Between Past and Future, Ukrainian Art in the Face of War. Katya. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, thank you. Uh, Susan uh, for this invitation and I'm really delighted to be uh, here and to talk uh, to you about Ukrainian art and in the beginning I was uh, I want also to thank to Ukrainian army for making it possible because for a long time we have a big fight in the south and eastern front line and also we had a huge fight in Kiev region and um, everywhere it's still a uh, very high risk risk of um, being occupied and being shelled by uh, Russia Federation. So I'm really thankful to all people who are currently on the front line and who are defending our freedom and our country. And also, I want to thank to all uh, US citizens for um, helping us and supplying uh, our army and also helping with humanitarian aid uh, with any possible help, which is uh, uh, we feeling uh, strongly and we know that um, we have uh, such a good friend uh, who are standing uh, with us. So, and I will start to share my screen. Um, and in the beginning, uh, my actually, uh, my lecture entitled between past and the future Ukrainian art in the face of war. And I will speak more about Ukrainian current situation, but I, when I was uh, preparing this, consider the art history as well, because we uh, for a long time was uh, forbidden and wasn't uh, seen and visible in the international art history. And for uh, many chapters, um, Ukrainian artists was uh, present as Soviet or as Russian, but not only because of that, many events was happened and the art history have been changed. And my first starting point, I have two of them. The first one is a um, uh, phrase uh, taken from the own con uh, concept of the history, a thesis on the philosophy of the history by Walter Benjamin, that he argues that there is no document of civilization that is not at the same time the document of barbarism. And the second quote, um, which I am referencing to, this is Franz Fanon, the um, uh, a researcher who was working on the uh, decolonial and post-colonial ideas and he said that for colonized peoples the most essential value because the most concrete and the first and foremost the land the land which is, will bring them bread and about all dignity and quoting him i want to raise the question about identity of course but also not uh, um, based on the um, uh, 
uh, ethical and ethnicity, ethnicity, but also uh, the identity as a political issue, land uh, from the perspective of law. And uh, for example, in this case, the annexation uh, of territory is uh, a very important issue, uh, but also land as, as roots, as a cultural roots. And then uh, later I will come back to all of these examples. So um, I want to show you two uh, images that was made by Russian soldier uh, near Izum. It was before the tragedy, bef before liberation, and before we recognize how many deaths this land have. And this uh, exact image and another one, and this one, this is was taken um, by uh, one local, um, uh, deputy and he was published it in the Facebook page um, saying that this is the last thing that uh, the Russian soldier uh, witnessed in this Ukrainian territory during this fight. I assume that this images was taken when he was falling and accidentally uh, he uh, made this video or two images uh, uh, so we can see uh, what the invader have seen on just before his death. But what this images is um, um, telling us, does it only about the processes of um, invading or does it image of um, um, colonization or its image of uh, the how empire uh, seen us. Um, I was trying to find some historical references and um, I was uh, surprised that the same images was uh, uh, showing us by Taras Shevchenko, the prominent Ukrainian uh, poet and uh, painter um, who was uh, the peasant and who actually make a canon for Ukrainian literature. Uh, Taras Shevchenko is really an iconic uh, person, and he sometimes came up, especially for, in such uh, essential and cruel moments, like uh, the Yevromaidan, for example, or the uh, uh, Russian war in Ukraine. But in this case, what is interesting that uh, these two images was um, because he was painter, uh, he took part in ethnographic expedition in Aral Sea, and this is, was somehow um, organized by his friends uh, from Russia because at the time he was in prison and he was uh, forbidden for writing in Ukrainian language. And at the time it was so um, the um, law against Ukrainian language was uh, made by the um, Tsarist Russia. And for Taras Shevchenko, it was only one um, way to uh, conduct his artistic um, ideas. This is through uh, paintings because he cannot, um, he couldn't uh, write poetry or novels. So he was um, doing such drawings um, and their friends just to try and to save him from the prison decide that maybe such expedition would be a way to uh, survive or also help him to see uh, free land. And he was participating in this expedition in 1848. Um, and of course he, was, uh, he wasn't uh, on the native land, but he saw lots of similarities around the wild nature that was resistant, the wild wind and very strong wind. Also some Russian Cossacks who tried to um, violence the nature, like for example, in one of the diary of Russian uh, Cossack, it was mentioned that um, for him and for Shevchenko as well, the cruelty against the nature, it was the same as its, its cruelty against the humanity. And Shevchenko as a romantic, he was uh, literally seen um, such um, evidences as uh, part of the crime. Um, so this summer, um, I witnessed uh, a lot of, I would say that I will type, start perhaps from the different angle that uh, today, of course, many Ukrainians try to resist and to react and somehow uh, communicate 
the resistance. And for artists, it's also very important to do it. And of course, uh, for many of them, it's still uh, impossible to use some materials or to continue in their work because they are in occupied uh, places, or for example, they have very strong uh, feeling of speechless, um, but they act in differently. For example, they communicate in through social media or writing something, or they donate in money, or for example, they, um, recognize that the art not so valuable if uh, but it would be more uh, important to go to the army and to join the uh, ukrainian military forces or for example to uh, help uh, with volunteering work and some of the artists just uh, literally do not doing anything but um act very actively actively as uh, activists and um, supporters uh, and this is just one of the examples. Uh, it's Anton Sayenka artwork, but he didn't recognize it as an artwork. He um, explained such uh, drawings as um, uh, exercises be uh, before he will paint. But at the end, he draw a lot of um, sketches. And at the end, you, you always uh, witness the landscape. Um, some resistance in this landscape and Anton Sayenka the artist who um, was born in Sume uh, and now lives in Kiev and I was speak with him and ask do you um, want to go somewhere abroad or take part in some residencies or exhibition and he said that for him it's very important to be present uh, and to be now in Ukraine and for him this connection with land is very strong and important and looking to these different um, a picture of nature, he tries to uh, depict this resistance to this strong wind. And uh, interestingly, that it is in the same uh, work of Walter Benjamin, which I quoted before in the beginning, he also uses this image of a strong wind as a wind of uh, progress, as a wind of future. Um, and describing it, he used the metaphor of the angel by Paul, Paul Clier, one of the iconic artwork. And he said that uh, all of this resistance um, um, depicted in this uh, artwork by Clier, and we see how the processes of colonization come up and how uh, this angel tried to protect his um, past as well. Uh, so just to try to uh, not be um, fallen or not to be um, brought it somewhere, but just trying to be at the same time in the same place uh, where he was. And today speaking about nature and about the connections uh, with the land um, and with the soil, uh, I assume that we uh, should look uh, more broadly to this question. Uh, for example, witnessing a lot of digital um, documentary materials like satellites, images, we can see clearly how our land is looks like from the um, uh, from the sky, like how, for example, the birds uh, look into our land. But also this is shows us um the processes of how history is created how the small um story of one biography could be lost in this huge historical narratives and this is an image made by um, new york times the uh, material about butcher massacre and this is shows us the evidences of this cruelty but also this is, shows how this um uh, almost invisible bodies are present in the Ukrainian roads. And this is, could be also a good metaphor of time and being present in this time. Because in the beginning, I said um, about the role um, of art, um, current art, um, in our perception on the art history. But also, it is important who was uh, written this story. Uh, and this is not ob uh, this is quite obvious that uh, all of the great narratives was uh, written by the empires and by the um, uh, 
uh, male characters and also it was the narrative of the victory but not cruelty and not uh, murdering uh, murder people not the rape uh, people but not from the violence side and all this violence actually present differently as a glorification of victory as a glorification of some fight and so on. And today it is very important to look um, to whole our history from the side of everyone who was forbidden and everyone who was forgotten. Um, and this exact image actually show us how we trying to uh, not see some very important uh, events. For example, when the Bucha was happened and lots of people start posting images of dead bodies just to recall um to uh, just to uh, as a way of uh, asking for the help or like inform people what actually happened in ukraine and social media start ban this uh, content and of course for many ukrainians this is a way of how we uh, how this like a function of sensitive contents become uh, immediately a fact of the censorship and how uh, from one side um, you are fighting with a very um, uh, big aggressive country which have lots of money, lots of uh, weapons and lots of resources and uh, comparing to it you always have to find any other uh, possibilities to talk about your um, situation but at the same time we saw that perhaps the social media could be this way to tell our story. But at the end, we also um, seen that the social media again could be uh, the same uh, apparatus, which um, um, doesn't want to show uh, the real history because of this like ethic, because of the people do not want to see this brutality. Um, and again, going back to the situation, to the response of the contemporary art in Ukraine, I want to show you a couple of images uh, to in support of my idea. And this is a um, series of work by Anton Sayenka, whom I mentioned before. And he is doing this series with um, Yaroslav Futinsky. And this is abstract paintings, which uh, have nothing uh, specific, just like blue or dark uh, brown or um, uh, black paintings, which has uh, also very small uh, titles and very small signs. Like, for example, this one, it's um, entitled Tilo, which is body. Uh, and it's interestingly that uh, how this uh, author uh, uh, makes this sign, that you see that the first letter is more clear and then the word is disappearing. And also the, the size of this sign in this painting is not big. So it seems that the body of the person, which is very important for the um, Ukrainian situation right now, and the each, uh, not body, but the each person, each uh, community become very essential to the resistance. But at the same time, looking to the history itself, how, for how long this history is, you see how the history is um, um, took in uh, these people from the narratives and just like blowing them up or, or they just disappear from these grand narratives and lost uh, in all the story. And this is exactly the same what um, Christina Melnik is doing. But of course, in her painting, this uh, idea of um, man becoming a landscape is uh, depicted differently. And this is exact uh, image, I would say, more, more references to the um, picture of the satellites of how the dead bodies of uh, in Bucha massacre was looks like. And of course, looking, for example, to these images from the perspective of environmental humanities, we see how it's really is, uh, how it's present. And then we again recognize uh, how long is our history, because for now, many people speaking about the Soviet period, but the Soviet period is not the only one period of history that we had. And we had before uh, the history of being a part of Russia empire and Shevchenko, whom I mentioned before, uh, was a part of this story. And he was also a slave whom, uh, 
who did a great career in painting and writing as well, and who from the poor peasant become a national and iconic symbol in Ukrainian literature and uh, painting tradition. Uh, but also, again, speaking about this connection with um, nature and the environment, I want to show you another artwork. It's a photography made by Artem Gumilevsky, um, the photographer from Kharkiv, and he started, uh, he actually, the, his medium is the body itself. And he trying to put himself in different uh, situation in different environments and this is specifically he tried to put his uh, body um, in this tree and of course this is uh, not clearly tell us about the war and the uh, fights for the freedom but uh, you can see all of this uh, red um, color which is uh, directly bring us to the um, images of dead bodies and um, dead nature and the um, violent uh, violence that uh, Russian Federation is doing now. And what is uh, interesting in all of this uh, artworks for me is that the presence of being presence in some moment, being presence in the land or in the country is very important. And perhaps this is why many Ukrainians want to go back home afterwards and even now they're not leaving their country because they want to be present and being there it means already that this is a big act of resistance because they're not escaped they're still there they're going to the front line and they are helping people with uh, different supplies in humanitarian aid and this is because they want to be present not only in the uh, territory of the country Ukraine, but also being present in the culture and uh, being present in the history. Um, and just one another example, uh, uh, which is uh, have been made by Valentin Rayevsky in 1993. And what is interesting in this work is that this is the first international exhibition, the first the, uh, big exhibition uh, abroad. And Valentin Tin Rayevsky was participating uh, in very interesting exhibition in uh, Zamaku uh, called uh, uh, Steps of Europe. And the idea was again about this um, front line between Europe and Russia. And at that time, the curator Yezhe Onuch was uh, speaking about this ways of um, uh, from the Nordic countries to the south and from the east to the west and uh, um, uh, vice versa uh, through Ukraine. And is it possible to um, reconsider this land and to see differently and not to see it as a uh, gates of Europe, as Serhi Plehi said. And Valentin Rayevsky was working a lot uh, with the mythology and as a Kievan artist, mostly and precisely with the Kievan mythology. Um, and these exact uh, images show us the Kievan landscape, three um, hills and in the middle he put uh, the very small figure of uh, the man um, and also with the help of the light he built this uh, huge shadow which is uh, shows us the metaphor of uh, uh, glorification of any person, it could be any person. And in this case, it doesn't matter, is it Soviet leader or is it uh, just a worker or is it politicians or is it writer or not? The main uh, thing in this installation is that um, the landscape or the person could be seen differently, but, it's, but what is matter is that all these narratives which we constructing around this person and around this land. And I think that it's also very important today is uh, going back to the 90s and to, receive, uh, to tr try to see our history and especially history of art differently because lots of uh, things like, for example, the fight for freedom is uh, very essential to exact this period because after the Soviet Union fall, we all um, start uh, living a different life and for culture it, uh, itself, it was uh, a very important time because the whole infrastructure was uh, uh, rebuilt and uh, with all 
language was used differently. And again, speaking about the connection with the uh, uh, land and uh, with the history, maybe the most um, difficult uh, example is a uh, hunger holodomor, uh, which is uh, translated directly as a, uh, to starve someone to death. And it was happened uh, because of Stalinist politics in uh, 30, uh, 1931, 1932, and 1933. Uh, and of course, for contemporary artists, they cannot use uh, um, they cannot speak about this experience uh, as a witness uh, because they didn't witness it. They know this story through the stories of the grandmothers and grandfathers. So in building these narratives, uh, they uh, trying to use different materials and trying to show this uh, story from the current perspective. And of course, um, living today, experiencing today uh, war and uh, seeing how many uh, fields was destroyed by Russian army, uh, many artists also trying to refre reflect this history and trying to connect it with the past. And this, uh, I will show you two works as ex an examples. This one, it's uh, Maria Leoninka made in spring uh, 2022 uh, during the residency in Nersertement Nakimnate, and she made this uh, small pieces as uh, from the bread uh, directly and another I would say that now it's one of the iconic works of our uh, resistance this is Janna Kadyrova uh, with um, in collaboration with Denise Ruban called Palenitsa um, also made in assortment na Kimnata and what is interesting that she's using stones and all of these pieces of bread, it's a sculpture made uh, from the stone. And maybe some of you knows the story about Palenitsa that in the beginning, um, many people start uh, asking um, other to say word Palenitsa, which is called the, the type of the bread, which is translated as a type of the bread. And uh, no one in Russia could uh, repeat it properly. And of course, they was joking. There is lots of jokes that this is uh, um, Polonitsa, which is blueberry or strawberry, uh, st strawberry, sorry. And of course, for many Russian speaking Ukrainian, this is a very easy word and everyone could, could say Polonitsa. So uh, this is exact artwork not very connected to the history of uh, famine but also recalls the um, future famines with which could be possible it could be uh, because of uh, war in ukraine and because of russian invasion and uh, to sum up this part of my uh, talk i want to to show you another work. This is a screenshot uh, from the video um, made by Yaroslav Futinsky, who are all of these people who, are, who have seen the same landscape made by him in 2018 in his um, native village Paninka in Khmelnytsky region. And he burned his hand uh, and he was standing on this uh, stone in the middle of the lake where before was a huge uh, paper factory and it in 1905, it was a huge strike by workers who trying to recall and, of, um, and to raise the question of human rights. And of course, this um, movement of uh, workers was uh, violated by the um, director of this uh, factory and all of the people who was uh, taking part in this labor movement was uh, um, somehow violent it as well and all this uh, movement uh, and, and the memory of this resistance was uh, forgotten for a long time. Uh, Yaroslav Futimsky working a lot with the local history and with especially uh, with the history of resistance, he working a lot uh, with biographies of people uh, of these activists and being at the same time activist as well for him it's very important to bring these connections even it's not a direct connection but but still uh, see uh, um, similar scenes in the previous um, generations uh, and him 
so he was doing this performance uh, for uh, for some time, and at the same time, he became this living monument to all of these people who was oppressed uh, by the power. And in this case, he's uh, talking about that fact that he's living in the same environment, he's witnessing the same landscape. Uh, and of course, he lives in different time and facing different problems, but still uh, this memory is present and the nature is remember, uh, nature itself re remember about everything that was happened in this area before. And after he would, uh, after him, it's also would be somehow reflecting in this nature. So uh, for Yaroslav Futimsky, it's very essential to uh, seeing history much more uh, broadly and much more further than the current times. So that's why also in my uh, lecture, I use this idea of the past and future um, and the place of our contemporary uh, time and um, events uh, to see, to rethink our past and also to rethink our future, how we uh, looks uh, at our future, how we um, imagine it, what kind of value, values we want to bring there. Um, so this is perhaps uh, the end. I can stop and then in the question I can go to another slide and maybe to show you some other uh, artworks and um, yeah, explain some other things. Thank you. Thank you, Katya, very much. I'm sure we can all show our appreciation uh, by pressing the clap uh, icon on our Zoom bar. So thank you very, very much for that very interesting talk. Um, we will be, we will open therefore a little early, but Katrina can, you know, you can intervene as you said and show us additional slides if you so wish. Um, we will then therefore open the floor for questions. Um, just to repeat what we have put in the chat and said earlier, um, please type any questions into the chat and then Joe and I will read them out uh, and invite Katya to respond to those questions. So um, could you please, uh, I invite everyone to type your questions in the chat. Thank you. Okay, well, we have our first question uh, from Professor Susan Smith-Peter, and she writes, thanks for your talk. It seems that the land itself is a major partner in the work of many of these artists. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, I think it's even, it's not present as an image in the work. It's still very important now. Uh, because as I said, um, for some people, it's essential to be there right now. And this is already a huge uh, performative act, uh, as we can say uh, that, but also um, I was thinking, and here I, And because I was thinking about the road as also major, um, one of the important uh, images, but also the way of uh, uh, displacement, for example, or migration or uh, traveling, because even if it's not the tr tragical uh, resettlement, if it's the choice of the person, it is still very important to uh, tell about this uh, uh, movements. Like for example, many Ukrainian artists in the beginning of 20th century, they was um, making bridges between Kyiv and uh, Paris, for example. And they um, bring this, um, tradition from Europe to Kyiv before uh, Soviet Union was happened. And 
of course, after all, for all of them, it was quite difficult to uh, continue in their work because they was uh, banned by the Soviet times. And for example, I will show you a couple of um, slides. Uh, this is uh, Mark Chagall, but his illustration to um, uh, Ukrainian author, Ukrainian Jewish author, um, uh, David Hofstein, uh, which is referencing to the uh, tragical Jewish history in the beginning of the 20th century in Kiev and the uh, Jewish pogroms and the resettlements and uh, deportation of uh, Jewish communities to other places. And you see how the image of the person become at the same time the image of the road. Um, and wh why, it is, wh why it's important to talk uh, about these works in the context of Ukrainian art is that this book was published uh, by the Jewish Ukrainian community, um, uh, which uh, supported uh, Jewish history, of course, but they also was um, promoting Ukrainian independence idea and especially uh, Many of them were students by uh, students of Mikhailo Boychuk, who was organizing, uh, co-organizing the uh, School of Arts and the Academy of uh, Arts in Ukraine, which is still exists. And another works of Manuel Schechtman, and it's actually uh, he is a good friend of the uh, Mikhailo Boychuk, whom I mentioned, and he also was referencing to the idea of uh, the Jew uh, to the topic of uh, Jewish pogroms in Kiev, and um, talking about this uh, tragical history. But being a student of Boychuk, he used a lot of these references to the Ukrainian uh, painting tradition as well. And this is his first uh, artwork, um, his diploma um, in the academy. In, on the front, uh, on the back of his mother, you see uh, that people who was suffering from the violence at the time. Another example, it's Mamut Churlu, who was, um, who is a Crimean Tatar artist and who came back to Crimea in 1989. Uh, and this exact work uh, called Deportation, just uh, directly showing these roads of uh, people who want to uh, go back home and who was um, deported from um, uh, Crimea by uh, Soviet army. And two other work, which is not, um, this is still his practice, but still uh, he didn't tell us uh, about this uh, tragedy of his nation, but um, using this idea of landscape, he tries to depict uh, what uh, have been lost in his personal uh, biography and uh, his personal life. And of course, this uh, landscape come up through the dreams, through the, um, stories of uh, relatives who are trying to tell you more about the Crimea and of course for many of them it was even difficult to speak about it because uh, uh, living in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan as they didn't feel themselves protected and of course they feel that someone can uh, wrote uh, Donos or something like this like the uh, document for the um, uh, Soviet army to claim them that they did something wrong or like to be in prison or so on. Another work is um, work by uh, Mikola Mik uh, Karbanovich, the artist from Odessa, who um, recall his family history, Jewish, uh, Greek uh, family from Odessa, who was deported as well as many Ukrainians to Kazakhstan. And this is very simple video. So he uh, he's showing us this empty, decent landscape in Kazakhstan and this red bus coming to the middle of the um, screen and then again disappears somewhere. So this idea of being uh, tr not traveling, but uh, uh, trying to find the place and trying to uh, um, find the roots as well. This is very important and perhaps, um, okay. Um, yeah, and 
this artwork by Katya Lisevenka, this is just somehow sum up this whole tragic history that was happened with uh, Ukrainians through uh, many centuries that it's, especially this is of course connected with the 20th, first, uh, 20th century, 21st century, and mostly with uh, Soviet times, but uh, this, this was happened even before, and this violence that constantly repeating uh, um, this is just show us the lost elements in our history. And again, the question from which I started that who is writing this history and what is the matter of this loss and absence? Um, does we have in the does really museum show us the masterpieces or it just show us everything that was uh, present that it's present in the time and the most uh, the biggest value of this work is just being um, survived from the wars from the violence um, but if we would be if we will imagine that there is something else that have been lost, but still we can find it in uh, from the materials, uh, from the archive materials, or from uh, talks uh, with uh, people. Maybe this uh, absent elements will change uh, the huge narratives of art history, of the global history, and will tell us differently. Thank you. Our next question comes from Professor Sarah Pollack. She asked, could you reflect a little more on how the lines between political activism, various forms of documenting and archiving the present moment and art are overlapping and being redefined during times of war? Mm -hmm. um, the, I would say that in the starting with Maidan in uh, 2014 and the war in 2014, many artists um, decide to uh, use uh, documentary optics and go into archives. So we had this huge uh, documentary torn um, in visual arts uh, and many artists use it quite differently. Some of them um, was working with uh, collective trauma uh, or like different tragical events in Ukrainian history. Some of them was working with family history uh, and this is uh, was the um, tool how to connect these uh, different events and how to show uh, how to rethink uh, the tragical history in by now uh, in nowadays and to understand what why we lose it why uh, we didn't um, uh, you know the uh, didn't uh, fill the task. Uh, which have been, which should be done in the past. But also speaking about activism, I think that it's very important to mention that lots of artists um, now in the front line as a soldiers, and I think that this is like exact the huge, the very important example of activism because they are not, um, Maybe this is like the best performance that they could do uh, um, in these circumstances. Uh, and also, as, as I said, the second option is that uh, some of them are volunteering and raising uh, money for the army and for civilians. Some of them um, taking part in restoration and Yaroslav Futimsky, whom I mentioned, he, for example, every week uh, go into Chernigiv, uh, Ch uh, Chernigivska Oblast to uh, restore uh, building of building, buildings of civilians. And it's I think it's uh, the big um, uh, one of the important uh, uh, ways to act right now, not only being an artist, but also being uh, citizens and also to do something for um, people who are in more value, uh, vulnerable position because, uh, you know, the situation is that um, uh, I would say that many Ukrainians try to, um, they have empathy and they feel uh, solidarity with people and they just trying to act somehow and 
yeah, using this uh, different ways, being a soldier, uh, being a volunteer, or like, yeah, this is helps them to, uh, to bring this energy and to share it with people who are in minor position. So I, I think that now the activism is one of the interesting topics and the uh, important topics to talk about because even uh, people who are promoting the non-violential ideas who was standing on the idea of um, um, non-violential resistance, they are also taking part uh, actively in uh, Ukrainian military forces. So the situation have been changed rapidly and sometimes choices and the ideas about what is art uh, is quite transgressive now. And you cannot uh, um, divide it to very convenient genres. Thank you. Um, I will read the, the next questions, which are from Professor Brian Averbuch. Um, he has actually two questions. So I will read the first one and then invite our speaker to respond. And then I'll read the second one. Uh, Professor Averbuch writes, uh, first, thank you very much for a fascinating and important talk. I have two questions. Here's number one. Speaking as a scholar activist who is already supporting the defense of Ukraine, what can we do to show solidarity with Ukrainian artists right now? Uh, I think that you can do, <laughs> I mean, I don't know because it depends of the resources and the power and the uh, way of solidarity, but you can do everything. You can uh, post information about Ukraine. You can write uh, texts about it. You can um, invite Ukrainian scholars to give talks. And uh, it could be uh, very important and even maybe more important for academia because academia still have this Russian dominance and a lot of Russian scholars who are still promoting idea of how great Soviet Union was and so on. So it's like very difficult to uh, fight with this because there is lots of materials that have been written. And um, yeah, so perhaps uh, such academical consolidation would be the best way for the scholars. Thank you. Um, uh, I see that uh, our friend Valentina Karkun has a hand raised. Valentina, are you responding to this question as well? No, no. I, I just, I just want to um, to uh, to ask questions. And since it's quite a few, if it's possible, can I just speak up uh, and not write, if it's possible. Okay, I tell you what, we'll finish with the second question okay. from Professor Averbuch, and, and then we'll turn to you. Okay, thank you. All right, the second question from Professor Averbuch reads, the, the phenomenon of social media platforms silencing Ukrainians, including artists, by blocking images which portray current realities in their country is very disturbing. Any thoughts on how we can combat this? Uh, well, it's actually a big problem right now because um, as I show you the case of Bucha, but this is not the only one case that uh, we faced with, but I, I don't know how um, work with it, uh, with the technological tools because uh, unfortunately, um, providing this uh, tool of sensitive content, uh, the Instagram as a company band, more activists and artists, um, and even some big masterpieces, uh, which um, are very well known, but depicting naked body, for example, it's also was banned. And I think that also the way of how we can resist this is just to talk about this and write. And I do remember that the first case was happened in last year during the Palestinian and um, um, Israeli war. And the Instagram was banned, the mosque, which was 
which has very similar name as a terroristic organization, but it have nothing to do with it. And after the image was deleted, it was a huge uh, uh, way of um, materials. Uh, the, it was a big conversation in uh, New York Times, in The Guardian, and then they bring this image back. So they somehow um, react on it. And I think, and of course, this is just one example, but the way of how we can uh, precise this technological um, uh, sensitivity is just talk more about the cruelty. And uh, again, to see this not only from the perspective of uh, hiding uh, difficult information, but just try to react on this information. Because many people, um, here in Europe, for example, they know the situation in Ukraine, but, but they just don't want to know any details because if they would know these details, it means that they should act somehow. And this is, of course, very comfortable position because it's comfortable to have comfortable life. But I think that the time have been changed and we have to solidarize with people who are suffering, not this is not only Ukrainians, right? Many people uh, have the same problem. And especially for now, for example, I would say that Ukrainians are privileged because we have this support and we feel this support, but how many communities do not feel this support? And even in Ukraine, we have this uh, um, difficulties, I would say, with people in uh, who are LGBTQ, for example, in uh, army or being just present in Ukraine, they are uh, visible, but still they have uh, less uh, option be visible, for example, in the global context. Thank you, Katya. Uh, Dr. Valentina Karkun has a, a question. Valentina, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. I, I was just trying to write it down. So if, if I may just speak out, is it uh, okay? Sure, if you're having difficulties, yeah. Uh, uh, so first, first of all, thank you so much, Katerina, for your wonderful presentation. Um, probably not all, all of you know that uh, Katerina also offered quite a few absolutely brilliant essays on her experience on the war, and uh, it's translated into English. If you want to know how 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 artists can survive for all different difficult time, just uh, please read it and uh, have an opportunity. I would like to public uh, publicly thank you, Katerina, for open your heart and sharing your experience. And I want you to know that it helped me tremendously to cope with, with my trauma of um, experiencing the war and live in Ukraine. Uh, my question, the first question is about your exhibition. Um, uh, let me tell the audience that you, you had um, a one day exhibition in your destroyed flat. And just reading about this exhibition and looking at your picture, then you are staying in your destroyed flat, looking for non-existent window uh, of your flat. It's just one of the biggest impression uh, uh, from the for the war experience. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about why you decided to uh, have this exhibition and what is your feeling of home uh, uh, during then you're preparing this exhibition and going through this exhibition. And second question is about uh, the war and different reactions of different artists uh, on the war. As we know, war didn't start on February um, 2022 and started uh, uh, long before in 2014. Uh, but we we're now talking about two different periods of the war, right? Uh, before February and after the February. I'm wondering about the different uh, um, experiences of artists are going through a uh, different images they're using before the February and after the February. If you can generalize and provide us a little bit about these different experiences. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valentina, for this uh, feedback. It's uh, very important to know that uh, my essays somehow reflect in, in different people and help them to uh, cope their own um, problems and experience as well. Um, the question why I did this exhibition, I actually don't know how to answer because this is just 
somehow come up and I decide to make it. And then uh, the whole his exhibition was more like intuition uh, based on the intuition uh, and some feelings. But at the end, I recognize that it has strong narrative, which is um, the speechless that we had this pro uh, problem uh, of just lost meanings of words or just understand that nothing is helping us like for example we call uh not for the protecting our sky for example and we ask uh, european countries to protect our sky it didn't it didn't happen in mariupol it was sign deity which is in russian kids and still the mariupol drama theater was bombed so the words uh just didn't work even it was the same uh, language of the invader right the and then you just feeling that uh it should be something else and mm -hmm. lots of artists was feeling the same and they start working uh, they start this personal search and personal uh, desire to understand what how to talk about it what kind of visual language is reflects but also the images become speechless because we all the time are constantly in the social network we've seen uh dead bodies and dead bodies and dead bodies and what could be more awful and more powerful and more uh acts i don't know in for many artists it has become a big problem and big, big question what kind of what role is for them now um and so this is what the first part and the second part is was the part dedicated to archive and I choose uh, one artist from the 90s who working uh, who actually collecting everything that he finds outside uh, on the streets and also some his own materials but another work is was just one work that was saved in my collection because it wasn't at the time in my apartment and this is also somehow explains me this um uh, situation with museums what kind of art pieces is it they show us uh, that sometimes it could be uh just accidental ex accident or like the i don't know the um not um um uh honest choice right um so like many reasons of how the museum collections are based and this is now the one of the fascinating stories right how to rethink the collection and especially this collection based on the stolen arts like hermitage for example still have lots of ukrainian uh, artworks which are marked uh um as russian and recently i was writing another essay for a um, academical essay and this is was about um uh, Kur uh Kurhan hills which is uh, graves as well and uh, russian ethnographical expeditions they just stole everything and uh, in 20 um Zero one. It was a big exhibition in Metropolitan Museum called the. I don't remember the exact uh, title of this exhibition, but this was like uh, Russian steps. But the most prominent examples was taken from Dnipropetrovsk uh, um, Oblast uh, and Crimea, which is Ukrainian part. So we still have a uh, lots of these things, and we have to rethink this history of artifacts and uh, artworks. And the third final part of my exhibition, it was the idea of what is going on uh, after the ruin and is it possible to bring life there and the key images was the image of a tree uh, which is growing from the stick and the first uh, artwork uh, that i found uh, it was uh, photography by um, anna zvaginseva who actually in this way commemorated her uh, grandfather who was living in a village and in that place lots of people make the defense uh, from the sticks uh, from the tree and many of them 
okay, maybe not many of them, but it was lots of accidents when these sticks become a huge tree and bring new life. Uh, so it's still possible to, even you think that there is no chances to survive, it's still there is chances to survive. It could be new life. Um, but um, I mean, I still uh, very, uh, I still have lots of questions about my exhibition because I don't know if I did it because lots of um, the whole effect was built around this my destroyed apartment. And uh, even this photography that I mentioned, it was an interesting thing that the um, light from the sun uh, was making this small shadow and many visitors were thinking that this is a part of the um, photography and this is the moon. But then they recognize that this moon is going from one uh, corner to another corner. So this is like a living thing. And uh, they recognize that this is a part of uh, the environment um, performance. Or So I think that the space itself creates uh, this exhibition, not only me. I just was like uh, bringing the artworks there. But the whole um, scene is just this place. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember the second question, unfortunately. Could you repeat it? It's, it's, it's about two periods of the war mm. and different reactions on different phases of the war. Yeah, as I said in the beginning, many artists was working with archives. Uh, but I would say that now it just... Um, because of this huge hyper emotional situation and many artists just for a couple of months uh, start uh, feeling themselves speechless. But at, at, the si at the same time, we have uh, other examples like Alessia Homenko, for example, who is doing lots of uh, paintings um, about the soldiers, for example, because her partner is in army right now, and she is depicting uh, Ukrainian soldiers uh, in her Syria. Um, also, uh, Vlada Ralko, who is uh, producing a very emotional graphic, and here I actually have to show you. Um, oh, wait, uh, I need to show you these images because they are very. Um, references to the idea of the past and very in a very um, um, critical way uh, speaking about the Ukraine as a part of the Soviet Union and just a minute. So I would say that there is uh, various of the reactions on the situation. Uh, but what is interesting to me is that um, we have new names which are come up and uh, who doing very uh, powerful artworks, which uh, is Kristina Melnik, whom I mentioned before, she is uh, younger generation. Or like this one, this is Aleftina Kahidze. She is, uh, of course, uh, working a lot uh, with the war topic even before because her mom and Aleftina is uh, originally born in um, uh, Donetsk region and her mom was um, living in uh, occupied part of Donetsk and she uh, died in the checkpoint because her heart was stopped. And this story just... Um, uh, very tragic and sad because uh, she spent five hours in this checkpoint just now have possibility to cross this uh, border because the line was so huge and many people just want to go back home and to or like to their relatives so this um, this is uh, images by uh, Vlada Relko who uh, very well known from her uh, Kiev diary and uh, which is references to the Yevromaidan experience. But in this one, in Viv diary, she even more uh, critical um, and just more brutal. How this piece and the idea of even the progress could be 
barbaric and violent, violential. And uh, just in, this is the, her real uh, image made in Lviv. Uh, and the bird who was killed um, during the um, shelling and her drawings as well about the um, dove of peace. But also how this idea of uh, uh, care, how the idea of uh, protection is very uh, close to the idea of uh, imperialism, is very clear to um, Vladaral Cohen, she uses a lot in her uh, artworks. Yeah, this one, the last one. And also, I have to say that uh, for now, um, it's very important to speak about the materiality because the many museums and um, libraries, cultural institutions are at risk and some of them was destroyed. I cannot uh, tell you the exact uh, numbers of how many cultural uh, objects was uh, destroyed partially or, or fully, uh, but in the Kharkiv region, it's just more than 100 uh, such objects. So uh, like, for example, uh, for um, Assortiment Nekimnata institution in ivano frankivs this question become one of the important when they create the residency program for Ukrainian artists and decide that this time they would not produce in talks or discussions, but they will help mm -hmm. artists to produce new pieces of works just to, you know, document this experience um, by doing uh, physically doing art, like doing some objects, because as I said, the objects are matter in the end <laughs> when we will create a museum again, or like the center explaining the experience of Ukrainians, we should show something and such work could be the way of how we can show about um, how we can tell our side of this experience. Thank you. Our next statement comes from Professor Susan Smith-Peter, bringing it back to the topic of censorship. She writes, I can speak about the blocking of discussion from personal experience. When I was writing about the Russian discourse toward Ukraine as a genocidal one, Twitter would block my tweets behind a sensitive content box. This is something that needs to be changed. Uh, yes, I agree. And this is uh, very interesting how sometimes the idea, the desire to like, uh, um, yeah, to use the power is very connected to this uh, idea of protection. And when I was uh, writing another my essay, I just I remember myself that uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't just now used by Russia this like care policy when they said that we will uh, protect Russian speaking um, uh, population in Ukraine, but also it was uh, in 2004 uh, as I remember correctly they said that they will. Um, uh, occupied the Tuzla Island because of uh, Taman Island, which is part of Russia, has a very big problem with the uh, ecosystem. So by occupying um, Tuzla Island, it means they will protect Taman Island. So it was quite a strange situation, politically um, very uh, tense. And it was happened, as I remember in uh, August, uh, by the conflict was solved by the end of the year so the conflict actually wasn't the militants but the idea of like stall ukrainian island if it's small and even not important but then if you will see the map of um Ukraine, Crimea, and Russia, and how this bridge to Crimea was built, you can clearly see that they built it through uh, uh, Ukrainian island. So they needed this island for this bridge. And then again, lo lots of um, evidences was happened even later, uh, but we just didn't see it as a, um, you know, as a problem or like we see this as a problem, but we didn't recognize that it would be uh, a big war for the independence, for the territory and for the freedom and for 
democratic values, we didn't recognize that the cruelty would be such a big uh, so I think that with uh, social media, it works the same. Uh, maybe uh, that there is real uh, disaster for parents, for example, and they want to protect their kids from uh, the pornographical or I don't know which kind of contact, like some uh, brutal contact. Uh, but I think it's also how I mean, the problem with censorship is that it's always come up with such uh, uh, very good ideas uh, uh, about the um, protection, right? But still, I think that the case uh, of freedom is very important. And we, if we're using uh, social media and if uh, the parents uh, say to kids that you can use like Twitter or Instagram, it means that they recognize uh, which content could be there. I mean, I don't know, it's quite uh, complicated, but I strongly stay on the position that um, maybe it just we sh shouldn't be protected by anyone. The, and maybe people should, um, I don't know, to manage this information by themselves, uh, but not by especially mm. big companies who are promoting the ideas, who are especially promoting the uh, big capital, who are promoting uh, and using this data for the commercial uh, companies. So I think it's quite a um, difficult question, but somehow we have to fight with this censorship because, um, as I said, mostly it's touched the activists, artists, and people who are um, against the violence and who are against uh, uh, such things, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's now 20 past three. I think that we have time for one more question that's in the chat. Um, this is from Dean Susan Holak, and she writes, it is my understanding that throughout Ukrainian history, Kobzars were a type of bard, musician, storyteller, artist, and oftentimes activist. Is this mixed presentation form active in the present circumstance? It's uh, very difficult to me to say because I think that now everything is possible and everyone uses the different tools and uh, uh, which help them. Yeah, so I unfortunately, I don't know how to answer in this, but um, experimental uh, forms may be even much more common um, and uh, used by Ukrainians right now. Okay, thank you, Katya. Um, we have put in the chat a number of informational things. Um, if people are interested in following up with looking at uh, uh, Kat Katerina's uh, publications, some of them can be found uh, online, also her blog as well, and also that uh, other things uh, will be going up on the website what is publichistory.com, which is the uh, the web page of the CSI history, uh, public history certificate program. So uh, please keep an eye open for that. Um, as it's now 22 minutes past the hour and we are closing at 3.30, um, I'd just like to uh, announce just briefly a few notices um we have uh other lectures in our lecture series coming up this fall um we have the history uh, department is co-sponsoring uh a lecture on the 27th of october with the uh, lackles program uh courtesy of professor sarah polak sarah would you just like to say uh, a brief word about that upcoming event.
if she's still here. I, I am here, sorry. Good Thank day, you. Sarah. Sorry, I was trying to find the unmute button. Um, yes, it's going to be by a doctoral student uh, in the Hispanic program um, who is also a Bresci um, fellow. And it's going to be called Before It's Gone, Community-Led Archives, Gentrification and Anti-Displacement Strategies in the Global City. And basically a quick summary, it says drawing from current literature on community mapping, archiving and initiatives against gentrification. This lecture elaborates on the importance of community digital archives as a critical tool to build counter imaginations about territory and further pathways for community ownership of land. So hopefully this will be of interest to a lot of people. It will be on Zoom at 1220 um, on Thursday, October 27th, and it will also be a clue event. And we look forward to many of you being there, we hope. Thank you so much for the opportunity to announce this. And thank you, Katerina, it was wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a, a pleasure to co-host, uh, co-sponsor, I guess, uh, the lecture uh, coming up on the 27th of October with the LACWAS program. So thank you, Sarah, for inviting us. Um, also in, in November, we have a third a third event coming up um, in uh, on November the 18th, at least that's the that's the date sketched at the moment, we will be having a lecture, uh, which we hope will be given by Paul Mirando, who is curator of the US Army Museum in Virginia, uh, and a notice on this event, and a flyer on this event and on the uh, lecture we've that uh professor sarah polak has just mentioned will be sent out in due course okay are there any final comments uh i think that uh everyone can you know show their appreciation for katarina's pre wonderful presentation uh, i see many people are already in the chat uh and also we we have a I'm mastering the uh, clap, uh, uh, whatever it's called, uh, on the on the Zoom as well. So, Joe, do you have any final uh, statements regarding students and Clue? Yeah, if you uh, are seeking Clue credit, uh, as I put in the chat, just send your name and Emple ID to joseph.frushi at csi.cuny.edu. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Katia, very much for your presentation uh, of obviously how art is being shaped by the current events. And of course, Ukraine events there continue to demand our attention, uh, even today with the events uh, to unfolding there regarding uh, Russia's uh, claims uh, to annexing parts of uh, occupied Ukraine. Um, so uh we thank you for speaking to us at this uh what must be for you and for your family and colleagues and friends uh, obviously a very distressing worrying time thank you eric thank you joseph thank you susan for inviting me and i really hope that next time we will meet in other circumstances when we um would be in the other position and perhaps we will meet each other in Kyiv or Donetsk or somewhere in Ukraine. I would be uh, very pleased to show you and host you there. Thank you, Katya. Our thoughts are with you and with, with Ukraine, so thank you. Um, I just asked Joe and, and Katerina to remain on Zoom so that we can have a final uh, chat before we shut down, but as it's 3.27, um, I would like to uh, close these proceedings. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for their questions, for their attendance and contributions. And again, join me in thanking our wonderful speaker, uh, Katerina Yakovlenko, for her very interesting talk. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Eric. 
Uh, yes, uh, would Brian. It be, would it be possible for me to ask a super quick uh, question just for, for further information uh, from uh, from Katia? Who's, um, yes, who's been uh, very generous from her time. Yes, I, I have. I have very time. little time actually. So if okay, you could okay. make it brief, because uh, I'd, I'd like to obviously <laughs> thank Katia and and Joe for their for their um, contributions today. Won't take but a few seconds. Uh, in very brief, uh, Katia, thank you again. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do as a professor, particularly of Islamic history and societies, is find ways to act. Uh, to advocate uh, for uh, Crimean Tatars and for the restoration of Crimea. And I was interested by your mention of this artist, uh, Mahmoud uh, Churlu. Uh, I did a quick Google and didn't find much. So I was just wondering if you might know uh, where one can find more information about that artist or more examples. And if, if time is pressing now, perhaps I could just type my email in the chat. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, type your mail and I can send you the information about him and maybe some additional information. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, I really also uh, uh, this is my uh, big suffering because I don't know much about this culture and I really want to bring it and to eliminate it in the especially in research context. So I would be, yeah. Uh, here it goes. Okay, and okay. wait. Uh... Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, so thank you once again. I'll sign <laughs> thank off. You. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Katya, very much for your talk. It was wonderful. Thank you both. It's um, yeah, as I said, this is a privilege to me to talk uh, in your university.